Our scripture passage today comes from uh, the Revelation of John. This is chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Now, before we read this, let's pause for a moment in prayer. Great and illuminating God, Lord, who has given us your word, Father, first to dwell in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and then as it is written in these words of Scripture, that we might know your good and perfect will for us. As we come before your word today, Lord, pour your Holy Spirit upon our hearts and minds, that as we hear and that as we read, we may also understand. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If anyone has ever been in court before, and not been as just an observer, but been to court as an actual defendant in the case, I think you'll find it is a pretty intimidating place to be. Now for me, the only time I've ever been a defendant in a court case has been just traffic court. Right? I mean, the, the stakes aren't very high. The most that'll happen is I might get a fine or have some points on my license. But I got to admit, the first time I went to traffic court, it was intimidating. I mean, you go there before the judge. He's, you know, he's in his robes. He's behind that high desk. And you've got like all the, just the, the gravity of the law of the United States of America kind of bearing down on you. And you've got a person who is there to judge your actions. To pass judgment on you. And I got to say, even with the stakes being small, it was a pretty intimidating place to be. I can only imagine what it would be like if the stakes were higher. What if I was standing before a judge and I was on trial for, for, for theft or even murder? At that point, this person could, the, the judgment he passes upon me could have horrible rep, rep, uh, replications for my life. I'd be fighting not just to get out of a fine or points on my license. I'd be fighting for my freedom. I could go to jail. I could, I could even be fighting for my life. That's an intimidating place to be. Imagine then what it would be like to stand before the judgment throne of God. Not just, to, not just judging this action or that action, but judging your entire life. Everything you've ever done. Everything you've ever said. Everything that you've ever felt in your heart. Right? And the ramifications of this judgment are even greater because it's not just your freedom you might be losing. It's not just your life you might be losing. This is your soul that is on the line, standing before the judgment seat of God. Pretty scary. Pretty scary to think about. In fact, I would say if you're not scared thinking about being before the judgment seat of God, you might not really understand exactly what's, what's at, it, what is at stake. Now, it's something that we don't like to think about a lot. And I'll admit, it's something I don't preach about a lot. And this is by design. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm a grace guy. I like to preach the good news. And in fact, our denomination and our faith is a faith of good news. That's what we do. We preach the good news of Jesus Christ. But I would not be doing my job well if I didn't at least from time to time 
warn you about judgment. I would not be doing my job well and I could not say that I'm preaching from this Bible, from this scripture, if I did not from time to time at least speak about judgment. Because judgment, no matter how much we don't like it, is right here in the scripture. It's in this Bible that we say leads us and guides us and tells us the truth about our world and about our God and about our relationship to Him. We find judgment all throughout it. And even if it wasn't in there, it's in our creed. Every Sunday, every Sunday when we say what it is we believe, using the words of the Apostles' Creed, right there at the seventh point is a creed, a part about judgment, a fundamental, a fundamental and essential part of our faith. And I will admit it is the scariest part of our creed, but I also, in another sense, find it the most poetic. It's one of my favorite lines to say. Not because of what it means, it just, it just sounds good. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Sounds like something Shakespeare would have written, right? From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Now, if you remember in this creed, we're, we're, we're going through this creed and we're talking about Jesus. We're in the Jesus part. And so the, the he shall come to judge the quick and the dead is talking about Jesus, right? And the thence is a fancy word saying from there. Now, last week, we talked about Jesus ascending into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God, as in he's in heaven and he's at a position of authority. And so it says, from there, from that position in heaven and authority, from there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Come down from heaven to judge the quick and the dead. Now, the quick is another fancy word. That just means the living. Now, I was really confused about that as a kid, saying this creed that one day Jesus is going to judge the quick and the dead. He's going to judge the dead, and for some reason, the people who are fast, he's going to judge them as well. And I was little, I was pretty fast, so I was kind of worried about this. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But why they call the living the quick, I, I'm not sure, because there are a lot of people alive that ain't quick, right? But I guess, I guess, if you're the slowest person on this earth compared to the dead, you're pretty fast. So however they get to this word, quick and the dead, it means the living and the dead. From heaven, from where Jesus is now, he's going to come back one day from heaven to judge the living and the dead. And so what we believe is that one day there's going to be a day of resurrection. And we're, we'll get into more details about that in a, in, a, in a later part of this creed. But there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Every person that's died, every single person is going to rise up out of their graves. And they're, they're going to rise up out of their graves and they're going to come and they're going to gather at the judgment seat of Christ. It says Christ is going to come down to heaven. His judgment seat will be there. The dead are now going to join the living, those who are alive, at the time Christ returns. And they're all going to gather at the judgment seat of Christ. And there is going to be a judgment of both the living and the dead. Now, if you want to know what this really looks like, um, the most explicit account we have of this last judgment comes in the book of Revelation. And it's Revelation chapter 20. I just read this part to you just a few minutes ago. And, and this part is full of symbolism, first of all. Because you have a point where it says death and Hades. The, 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 the dead are rising. And then, I guess, death and Hades, since they brought the dead with them, they come before the judgment seat of Christ as well. And so, you know, you've got Hades, which is the place of the dead. And death, this is just, well, I mean, that's death. And, and there are these personifications. There's these symbols and, and it says that Christ throws him into a lake of fire and sulfur. And you can imagine what kind of lake it is. In, in, in my mind, I just picture, I picture lava. Okay, it's a lake of fire and sulfur. They're thrown and they're destroyed for good. So at the judgment, the first thing that's being destroyed is death. Not only is death destroyed, but Hades, the place where the dead go, is also destroyed. So because death is destroyed, nobody can die anymore. And if for some reason you find yourself dead, there's no place to go. Because the place of the dead has also been destroyed forever. So at this point, there is his judgment seat. Okay, Christ has come down in the judgment seat. The dead have risen. The living that are, at the, are around at the time of his return, they're going to come to and they're going to gather around the judgment seat of Christ. And then it starts talking about books. Revelation says there are books and then there is a book. You've got books, and I think of like a little book like this. There's, it, it describes like there's this big old mass of these little books, lots of these little books. 
And then you've got one big book, which is kind of like think about this big Bible sitting here on our front table, communion table. So you've got a bunch of little books like this and one big book. And in these little books is an account of everything that we've done in life. And, and we're kind of led to believe that everybody has got their own book. In these books, everyone has kind of got their, their own little volume here. And, and they're going to open it up. And there's going to be the story of your life. Everything you've ever done is going to be read out here in this book. Now, I can't speak for your book. But for mine, there's going to be some things that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. You know, they'll be reading now. There's like, oh, yeah, there was that day in January, 1992. He helped an old lady across the street. That was good. I'm like, yeah, I did that. It was pretty, pretty nice. But then there'll be some things that I'm pretty embarrassed about. Some things that I, I wish they would not have read across the, in that book. Oh, yes, remember that, that day in 1997, someone cut you off in traffic. And you commented you wish that you had missiles on the side of your car so you could blow them up. Like, really? I said that? I said that? And that's not even going to be the worst part of it. So, and it says that we're judged based on what's going to be in these little books that, that God produces. And after the judgment, they're going to open this big book, like this one here on the altar table. They open this big book that they call the Book of Life. And they say if your name is not there on the book of life, written in the book of life, then that person is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. And this revelation tells us is the second death. This is the scary part of judgment. And I will say it is a terrifying vision. To think of yourself sitting there in the judgment seat of Christ, having your life, your heart, and your soul read out, and then those not found written in the book of life cast into a lake of fire and sulfur. This vision has scared generations of human beings. It has scared generations of Christians. And in fact, this has actually pushed all kinds of hundreds of people away from the faith. And they've asked themselves, what kind of God would take people, living souls that he created, supposedly loves, and cast them into a lake of fire. Cast them into a lake of fire that they call the second death. And there's a lot of believers that struggle with this too. Not just those that have turned away from the faith. Some good believers that struggle with this idea of the judgment. And the wrathful side of God that we find here written in scripture. We don't like it. But there's really no way to avoid it. This image of God in judgment and in wrath is in our scripture. This image of God in judgment and wrath is in our creed. And of all the people in the Bible, the one that talked the most about hell was Jesus himself. This is an unavoidable facet of our faith. The righteous will one day go to eternal life. The wicked will one day go to eternal destruction. We hate it, but hating it doesn't change it. But I think what makes it harder is the way we look at judgment. What makes it even harder for us to, to accept this and to kind of come to terms with it is not the fact that God's just judging, but it's the way we view God and the way we view his judgment. And sometimes, sometimes we get it all wrong. See, we get this image in our head of these books, you know, and, and that God's kind of just looking through these books and he's pointing out all the wrong things we've done. And, and, and sometimes we get this sense that there's a vindictiveness in what God's doing. That there's a vindictiveness even in Christ in reading out all our wrongs. We kind of, we confuse them with that, uh, with like a, an insecure hall monitor. Like the one you probably had in high school. You know, the one that just, he had nothing else going on in his life. And he just lived to bust kids and to get them in trouble. Maybe you've already got one in your high school right now. But I know we had one. And we just thought that's all that he lived for. Was to just to bust the kids and to get them in trouble. And we, and we have this image of God doing the same thing. He's like looking at his book and he's like, I saw that. I'm writing it down in my book. Oh, you just wait. Just, oh man. Yeah, oh, you just wait till I get you. We're going to talk about this, mister. Yes, we are. I'm pointing at my oldest son when I say that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and we get this image of God like almost like he enjoys it. That he enjoys judgment, that he relishes showing us his wrath. And sometimes we get this image because we've met Christians that have this almost sadistic pleasure in thinking about the judgment of God. And I've met, I've met believers like this, and they're, oh, you can just see the happiness in them. Oh, just one day God's going to judge. Oh, it's going to be great. I can't wait to see it. As if God is coming back to judge just to personally fulfill all of their vendettas they have in life. But this is not the God I know. This is not the God I know, and this is not the God that we have presented in Scripture. The God that I know and the God that I read of here in the Bible doesn't like to judge. The God I know doesn't enjoy wrath. He doesn't enjoy punishment. He's not relishing and can't wait for the day when he gets to judge all these wicked, awful, evil human beings and the wrong things that we've done. Scripture even tells us the reason, the reason why God is delaying so long in his judgment it's because he wants to show us mercy. He wants to show us the mercy that he's desiring to give us. In the prophet Ezekiel, it says that God desires the salvation of every man. And by man, they're talking to universal men and women. But God desires the salvation of every single person. His judgment and wrath is not something he wants to happen. Something that has to happen. The judgment has to happen because it is part of God's justice. We talk about a righteous God that we serve. And yes, part of that righteousness is His mercy, but also part of it is His justice. To allow sin and evil to go unpunished is unjust. Because when we violate the law of God, we not only have caused lots of misery and pain in the world, we have chosen what is evil over what is good. And that requires justice. I know y'all saw in the news this week that O.J. Simpson just died. And some of you were too young to remember the, the whole scandal of the O.J. Simpson trial, but for at least a year, a whole nation was consumed with O.J. Simpson. And even if you didn't want to be, you were because they talked about nothing but O.J. Simpson. And if you didn't know about him, he was uh, tried for a double murder and he was acquitted on both cases. And there are a lot of people who still think today that the evidence was overwhelming against him for murder and that he got away with it. And there's people to this day that still get angry at the fact that they believe that O.J. Simpson got away with murder. And you can think about that with almost any injustice. You think about an injustice, has nothing to do with you, didn't affect you at all, but it still makes you angry. It makes us angry anytime we feel like somebody has gotten away with a terrible wrong. Because if someone gets away with a terrible wrong, it feels like something is wrong with the world. There is something wrong that has gone with the world and it hasn't gotten put right yet. And you're right to think that way. Anytime there is evil in the world, something has gone wrong with the universe. And the reason why God's justice is so important is because He is putting to right everything that has gone wrong. Everything that is wrong with our lives, everything that is wrong with our world gets put right by the power of God's justice. If we're ever going to have a good world, if we're ever going to have the world that God has intended, everything that is wrong must be put right again. Now, I bring up this example, and most of you are going to say, well, I've never murdered anybody. And most of the people that sit at the judgment seat of Christ have probably also never murdered anybody. And you'll say maybe what most people like to say when they want to justify their own goodness. I'm a pretty good person. I haven't done anything that bad. I'm a pretty good person. Well, remember at this judgment, 
your book is going to be opened. The book of your life is going to be open. And you'll have in there not just the things you did, but it's going to read your heart as well. It's going to read everything that was on your heart, everything that was on your mind. And a sin that is on the heart is the same as in the flesh. For Jesus proclaimed to his people that if you hate in your heart, that is the same as murder. And if you lust in your heart, that is the same as adultery. And i got to say, if we're judged by what's on the heart, if we're judged after God and Christ have searched our heart, who among us is not guilty? It's a scary thought. It's a scary day. It begs the question how, if we're judged by what we did in those books, how can we ever hope to escape punishment? Well, the passage I read to you today tells you exactly how we escape it. It tells you exactly how we are brought into eternal life even though our books are found to be full of sin. You see, whether we go to eternal life or an eternal judgment, it's really not determined by those little books at all. Look what it says in verse 15. If anyone's name was found not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. It's easy not to notice because you get obsessed about what it says about these little books and we get worried about our whole life being laid out before the judgment seat of Christ. But it's not what happens in the little books that determines whether or not you go to paradise or you're thrown into a lake of fire. You're not judged by those books at all. I'm sorry, you are judged by those books. You're judged by your heart. You're judged by your action. But it's not what's in the book that determines your fate. The only thing that determines whether you go to paradise or not is if your name is written by Christ in his book. It's not the little book at all that determines our fate. That means it's not what we've done that determines our fate. It's not our actions that determines our ultimate fate. It's whether or not your name is written in Christ's book. So, of course, what everyone wants to know is how do we know if my name is written in that book? Well, if you call Christ Lord, your name is written in his book. If you believe in Christ as Savior, your name is written in his book. If it says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, your name is written in his book. It's all whether or not your name is in the book of life. And your name in the book of life has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with what you've done or haven't done. It has everything to do with what Christ has done. And you know, some don't like it that their salvation is out of their power. Because when it's taken out of these little books that are brought forth, it means it is out of your power completely whether or not you go to salvation. But if you don't like it, then I don't think you understand. The fact is, is that it is out of our hands and into Jesus' hands is the greatest bit of good news there is to hear. It means it can't be lost by us. Because it was given by him. You see, the same one that sits on the throne of judgment is the same one writing the names in his book. And the same one that sits on the throne of judgment, the same one that writes the names on the book, is the same one that died for the sake of your sins. Is the same one that rose to new life for you. The same one that reigns in power today for you. The same one that sits on the throne of judgment, the same one writing names in the book, is the same one that said to all of them, everybody, those who believe in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. See, a day of judgment is not a day for us to fear. A day of judgment is a day for us to look forward to. Not because we watch the evil perish. On that day, we're going to hate it every bit as much as God is that anybody should perish. It's going to be a wonderful day because you will hear 
your name called by Christ. You will see your name written in his book of life. That day will be the greatest display of his judgment and wrath. But it will also be the greatest display of his love and mercy. The world will meet its judge face to face. But you will meet your Savior. And the judgment of God will become his grace. And his wrath will become his mercy. To him be all glory forever and ever. Amen.